Um, my name is Rogan Garrett, B-R-O. Can you first name for us, sir? B-R-O-V-A-N. And on April 28th, 2023, well, me and my family were uh, on a fun vacation to support my uncle and aunt. What was supposed to be a joyous and celebratory day turned into a nightmare that will haunt me and my family for the rest of our lives. That night, after my aunt and uncle's wedding, an intoxicated Jamie Komarowski struck me and my dad while we were taking my aunt and uncle to their rental. The crash took my aunt's life. A bride celebrating the happiest day of her life just hours earlier. She was full of love and laughter and light, and her absence has left an unfillable void in our family, as well as others who had to have Sam ripped from their lives. The impact of this tragedy goes far beyond her death. My father and uncle were severely injured. My uncle to the point that he was not supposed to make it through the night. My father endured immense physical pain, a long hospital stay, and grueling recoveries as well, as having to watch my biggest role model and protector in life struggle that much to walk just a couple of feet, to sit up in a chair, and to watch him sit out while me and my brother would play catch. I too was injured, both physically and emotionally. The images of the mangled golf cart, staring at the leaves of the trees as sirens blared and lights flashed across them. My ride in the ambulance to the ER. Finally, getting to the ER and hearing my mom tell me what was going on. Finally seeing my dad in the state that he was in and listening to him groan while my mom shared the news to me about Sam. My thoughts were racing. What was the young wondering what was gonna to happen to our family? And thoughts of the brand new marriage, the marriage that got ripped apart in seconds. These are things that I relive daily. The fear of getting rear-ended again has haunted me since that day. And I did not stop checking my rearview mirror while I drive. The emotional and mental impact has caused me to often wonder how anyone could make the choice to drive while intoxicated. A choice that has brought so much harm to innocent lives. The decision to drive under the influence is not reckless, it's selfish and cruel. It is an act that destroyed a family and robbed us of a loved one who, can never, who we can never get back. This accident didn't just affect our bodies, it shattered our hearts and broke the spirit of a family that had come together for love and celebration. Instead of remembering that day for the joy of a wedding, we now associate it with grief trauma and loss. The few more days that I spent in Folly Beach were not pleasant. When I finally returned to the Red Bull that we were staying at, there was a dull feel to everything. The adults with us were usually taking naps or resting before they returned to the hospital to take their shift with my dad and uncle, while the older kids were tasked with keeping the younger ones entertained. My sister, refused to let me out of her sight. They would be constantly taking care of me while my mom was with my dad. I was faced with having to try and help my brother while he struggled with emotions that were not meant to be felt and processed by a 12 year old. Every little daily task was a struggle for me and everything seemed to move in slow motion. When it was time to finally go home, we came to realize that my dad was not going to be joining us. And that devastated me and my siblings. Having to separate our family in a time where all we wanted was to be together was very hard. When we got home and were forced to return to our normal lives, it was a struggle. Going back to school and trying to pretend like everything was okay was mentally draining. Everyone asking you the same question over and over again about whether you were okay or not was taxing. Everyday activities like classes, sports, and hanging out with friends felt pointless. And my motivation started to disappear when all I wanted was for my dad to come home. 
And when my dad finally returned home, the enormous burden that was placed on my family did not go away. While still having to help my dad recover, we were also hearing stories about how my uncle was doing back in South Carolina. They were hard to hear, and the combination of watching my dad <coughs> struggle to recover from his injuries made it hard to keep our hopes up for a better future. The justice process that followed was daunting and placed a lot of stress on me while I was trying to navigate this foreign world that I was dropped into. The big toll on my mental health and the fear of losing another family member has also affected many big decisions in my life. One of those decisions being after graduating to serve an LDS mission, which I was preparing my whole life to do and was looking forward to. I hope the court will consider the profound impact that Jamie Komorowski's actions have had on me and my family and my future. I ask for accountability and justice, not only for the harm done to us, but to send a message that such choices have devastating and irreversible consequences. Thank you for allowing me to share my story. Yes. Benjamin Garrett. Yes, sir. If you would tell us your name for the record. Benjamin Garrett. Your Honor, I, I just want to start out thanking all the first responders for that night. I know it wasn't it wasn't something that anybody would want to go through. Uh, and also, I just want to thank Paul Beach, the community, Charleston, Morgan, Utah, North Carolina, everybody around the world for supporting our families through this. Um, Your Honor, that evening was such a good night celebrating Sam and Eric and their love. And I was looking forward to driving them off to their rental with my son. Um, it was my only job for the wedding. Um, while we were on the drive there, we were talking <coughs> that night, you know, we were just listening to Sam and Eric talk, flirting with each other, roving and I were having conversations. We talked about the breakfast burritos at Bird's Market, how fantastic they were. And that's the last thing I remember that night. The next thing I knew, someone was tapping my shoulder, asking me if I knew where I was. And I remember opening my eyes and seeing all the lights and knowing that I was at the hospital. I had no idea how it got there or what had happened. The next time I woke up, I remember hearing Eric yelling in pain, just screaming, it hurts, it hurts. There was so much chaos inside the ER. Um, in and out of consciousness. I asked about my son and one of the nurses came back, I, I think it was a nurse, I don't know who it was, told me that it didn't look good. Um, and then a little bit later when I woke up again, they came back and told me that they'd given me the wrong diagnosis. They had given me Eric's diagnosis instead of my son. And that my son was with my wife and they'd be taking me back there. The hospital staff eventually took me back to go see my wife and my son. And that's when my wife told me that Sam didn't make it. They didn't know if Eric was going to make it through the night. It was my only job, and I didn't get to complete it. To make sure that they got their rental property and have their money. Your Honor, I had road rash all over my body. Um, that night, I had no idea what the extent of my injuries. I didn't want to move, I couldn't move. Um, had stitches in my forehead, an open hole in my knuckles on my left hand, giant gash on my right wrist, and I couldn't walk, I couldn't even stand. Uh, I actually, when they released my son, they told him I told him I was going home. 
and the doctors told me, well, if you can stand, you can go home. It was a struggle to sit up. And I knew that I'd be staying longer. After the first couple of days of my wife getting pretty upset with the condition that I was in, Dr. Hink at NUSC and her team took me in for surgery again. And fixed up the stitches on my forehead and also gave me a fish skin graft on my right wrist. I then spent the next nine days recovering from injuries and trying to walk. I separated my right SI joint, cracked my sacrum, and tore the labrum in my right hip. I had to practice sitting in a chair so that I could show the doctors that I could fly home and join my family who left. When I returned home, I was referred to the University of Utah Burn Clinic and instructed to see a general practitioner and orthopedic surgeon. I had more MRIs and x-rays due to problems in my pelvis, my back, and my neck. That is when they found that I had broken vertebrae in multiple places in my back and my neck. And I still have issues there today. I spent six months in physical therapy until my insurance told me I ran out of visits. Your Honor, this is just a list of the physical injuries, and most of them I'm still dealing with, and will need to have a hip replacement, fusion of my SI joint, and possible fusion of my vertebrae and my neck and my back. This will continue to be a burden that we'll have to deal with financially, physically, and emotionally for the rest of my life. The hardest part of this, the whole incident is the mental and emotional side. Your Honor, my wife and kids saw me in a state they should never see me in. And I am unable to be the husband or father that I was or wanted to be in the future. I should be seen as their protector, their rock. My kids and my wife now watch me go downstairs to make sure I can make it. They come out and carry things in from my truck or from our cars because I can't carry them in. These are all things that I could do on my own before. And I can't even do stuff around the house. I can't get on the ground to fix a faucet that's leaking. I can't get on the ground to pull weeds or fix sprinklers. Wrestle with my boys, run football routes, throw passes, swing a bat, swing golf clubs, be a catcher for my son when he wants to pitch. I can't even go for a run. I don't even like to run, but I can't go for a run. I would love to be able to do TikTok dances with my daughter like I used to. These are all things that have been taken including my hobbies of hiking, fly fishing, ice fishing, skiing. I get so fresh, frustrated that there's so many things that I can't do. And stuff that I do around my house, I now have to hire somebody to do. But before, I could just do it on my own. And whenever someone leaves our house, which we've got teenagers, so it happens all the time. We are nervous and always checking on, on them to see where they're at, hoping that they will make it home safely. It's a, it's a new fear for us. It's a new fear for me just to even make it home. I have a golf ball in my truck that when I start getting anxious, anxiety when I'm driving, I can grab that golf ball and rub the dots, the dimples in it, to help ground me and help me calm down. And I always go back in my mind to 
that night, me being the driver, if there was something that I could have done, something I could have done different. I replayed the, the events leading up to it constantly in my mind. Like Rogan going back to get himself to sit on his cell phone. How long we sat at a stoplight listening to a song. Could I have gone a different route? Could I have gone slower? Could I have gone faster? These are the things that I struggle with every day. Every day I am in constant pain and have no way to get the relief that I need. I have to go to work, I have a family to support, and I work in construction and drive a lot, so I can't take painkillers. When I get up in the morning, I say a prayer that the pain today will not be that bad and then I'll be able to do the things that I need to do to take care of my family. It is a daily struggle. Some days it's hourly. But I will not let James' choice to drink and drive that night keep me from trying every day to get better. Your Honor, I don't know Jamie. I don't know her personality. I've never talked to her. I don't plan on talking to her. So the decision to drive drunk that night was made well before April 28, 2023. I'm a strong believer that people have a moral compass in their lives, whether we agree with that compass or not. Everybody has a moral compass, and Jamie made the decision that it was okay to drink and drive well before that night. There is a statement that Jamie made in one of the calls to her father where she asked, why did this happen to me? Like she didn't have control over this. Your Honor, nothing happened to Jamie. Jamie happened to Sam. Jamie happened to Eric. Jamie happened to Brogan. Jamie happened to me. Jamie happened to everybody that was impacted by this. She chose well before that night to drink and drive, and it would be okay. It was not. I'm not sure that Jamie is remorseful. We are here today, a little over 19 months later, listening to her plead guilty. Even though I am thankful for that, and that we are going to trial, we did not get to delay the physical and emotional prison that Jamie put us in for 19 months. The evidence was there. Why did it take this long? Jamie will serve her time and the penalty that the court decides, and we will respect that. She will eventually get out but the prison that she has put us in will be with us the rest of our lives. We will never get Sam back. Our lives will never be the same. I think about having grandchildren and not being able to get on the ground and play with them. I know the court will do what it needs to do, and, we'll accept, and we will accept that. And I thank you for your time, Your Honor. You're welcome, sir. <laughs> thank you, Your Honor. Eric.